Chris Thoreau here from Urban Micro, and this is the first in a video series I'm going to do on doing a comparison of growing microgreens in soil, which is what I'm already doing, and growing microgreens using a fiber-based mat. So this is a big exploration for me. I've been growing microgreens in soil for a very long time, and um, so you might be asking, well, why are we doing this? So. My number one concern is the soils that we're using are often peat-based and with a component of perlite. Now, Canada is a major producer of peat, so it's something I'm kind of getting locally, but there are ecological impacts with not only mining the peat, but also the transportation of the soil and everything around that. Um, the perlite used in the different soil mixes is also very energy intensive to uh, create, so I want to try and move away from that, and hemp uh, and fiber mats might be the way to do that. Um, Quar, uh, which is a byproduct of the coconut industry, is often used, but that's also being imported from, from overseas. So there's ecological impacts there that I'm trying to avoid, and I'm wondering if uh, fiber mats might be the way to do it. Uh, they're lighter, they have less transportation emissions, and so just moving these products around uh, has an impact as well. Uh, space is another issue. If you're growing on even on a small scale or a commercial scale, you know, you need to store your soil somewhere and you need to sto store it before you use it and you need to store it after you use it. Now, sometimes you can put it into a garden and that's totally fine, but if you're doing very big production, you could end up with, you know, having dozens or hundreds of yards of soil between your fresh and your used soil. That takes space and time to manage. Uh, and then the other thing is cleanliness. Um, working with soil is messy. In a commercial system, you've probably got some good systems for dealing with that, but in a household system, soil can be a pain in the ass. Also, if you're looking at taking your product to restaurants, uh, eliminating soil is going to avoid them having to bring soil into their, into their kitchen, which is not something a chef really wants to deal with. So I'm really interested in this, this potential new growing medium as a replacement for soil. Now, I'm going into this with a bit of skepticism and a bit of hesitation. So there's a few things. First is, can I get the same product quality from a hemp mat that I'm getting from soil? And I've got a soil mix that produces great microgreens, so I know what a good quality microgreen looks like. I've grown close to 100,000 trays of microgreens and wheatgrass, so I know what I like. Um, from what I've seen, uh, I've seen various things with the fiber mats, and so I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, second thing I'm concerned about is water retention. You know, I've designed a soil that holds and releases water well, and in my system, I'm not sure how the hemp mat is going to perform. So already I'm thinking about how I'm going to need to adapt my system and my growing techniques to accommodate the hemp mat. Uh, third thing is heat retention. In my home production system, I'm using heat mats below my crop. And in a, in a commercial system, I'm often using a, uh, a supplementary heat source in that way as well. So this soil has a lot of mass and it holds heat really well. The hemp fiber isn't as, as bulky and so there's not as much to hold the heat there. The water content in the, uh, in the hemp fiber will do it, but that may not be enough. Uh, Post-production decomposition. I like in my home system that I can take this and literally throw it in my garden and mix it in with, with garden soil or use it as a mulch. And in a production system, a commercial production system, we can compost that and then you know move that soil somewhere else for use. I'm a little worried about what the decomposition about with these fiber mats is going to look like in terms of the amount of time that I'm going to have to be managing them afterwards. And then the last thing I'm concerned about is what I'll categorize as a life cycle analysis. Now, I'm making an assumption that on an ecological basis, on a carbon basis, that growing on a fiber mat is going to be more beneficial than using a, a peat or quar based soil. And so that needs to be determined. There are some life cycle analyses out there for peat, but I don't have any for the fiber mat. And so that's something I'll see if I can find enough information about to get a sense of what the actual carbon impact is with these two different products. Okay, so let's get into what these trials are gonna look like. Okay, so to start, uh, much against the advice I often give to you is I'm not gonna do any preliminary research. I don't wanna know what other people are doing. I don't wanna know their successes, their failures, their techniques. I wanna find that out for myself. 
Now, I want to do that because one, it makes for a good video series, but two, I think there's a lot of value in acquiring knowledge yourself. And so that's important for me in really understanding why a hemp mat does or doesn't work. You can tell me that stuff and I'll kind of get it, but when I experience it through trial and error, uh, and very controlled trial and error, I'm really going to understand things at a higher level. And this is why I always recommend you do a lot of your own trials. Now, I will, after doing my trials, go out and see what other people do. But I'm hoping that I can draw from my experience of having grown microgreens in, and wheatgrass and soil for so long to troubleshoot along the way. So hopefully I'm coming to the same conclusions that other folks are, or I'm finding solutions to problems that people are having trouble with. Okay, so let's look at our trial components. The first thing we're gonna talk about is the thing we're actually trialing is our growing medium. So I'm currently using a growing medium, which is here. I've got wheatgrass and sunflower going in it at, at the moment, and I've been using this medium for a very long time. Now, the basis of this medium is the uh, Sun Grow Sunshine Mix number four, but I modify it. My background is in soil science, so I like to geek out about soil science a bit, and I wanna create something that is gonna be ideal for microgreens. So the mix itself isn't bad, but I make two modifications. The first thing is I add a little bit of compost, and not so much because adding too much is gonna cause mold growth in your soil, but just enough so in the three to four days that the crop is photosynthesizing, it has some nutrient in there for good healthy growth. The other thing is I add a generous amount of perlite. Now perlite is like a, an expanded rock. Uh, it's heated up and it kind of pops like popcorn. It's porous and what it does is it holds water well, but it also releases water well. And so it's really good for creating good porosity in a soil, which means the soil holds water well, but has a lower risk of being saturated because it has good drainage properties. So that's really important. I've played around with the soil a lot and the mix I have works. And so I'm not gonna change that. And it's, it produces a great product. So the hesitancy in going to something else is that it's not gonna measure up. Okay, and what we're um, comparing the uh, growing medium to is a fiber mat. And so this is the one I'm going to use here. This is a product that is hemp based by Terra Fiber. And this company is based in Alberta, Canada. So it's actually being produced very, very close by. Uh, a hemp mat is a byproduct of the cannabis industry, which is very robust in Canada. Well, that's a matter of opinion. Um, and it's a in essence, it's a renewable resource. There's some issues with, with these ecologically, you know, is the hemp being grown, you know, organically or conventionally? So these things would, would play into its overall carbon impact. But the general mat here is a fiber base. You, you know, you can't really get a sense of the texture there, but it's quite rough, uh, maybe like a jute mat or something. And it's got a paper backing here. Uh, these, the, the mats I'm using are pre-cut to the 1020 tray size. Um, and, but they do come in rolls. So this is perfect. I've got 10 of these to trial, and that's gonna give me a good sense of um, um, how they work. Now, in the next episode, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, get familiar with these. So we're gonna look at what they look like when we get them wet and when they dry out and things like that. So we'll look at that in the future. So that's our growing medium. We're using a modified sunshine mix number four and the Terra Fiber hemp mats uh, produced here in Canada. Let's talk about our trays now. So the standard tray, as most of you know, is the 1020 growing tray. So this is what I'm using a lot here, but I use three different trays at home. I use the 1020 tray, I use an aluminum baking tray, and I use the paper pot uh, transplanter trays as well. So I'm gonna talk about each of these just very briefly. The 1020 tray is very common, it's used a lot, you're probably using it, and our hemp fiber mats are cut to fit in here perfectly. In fact, they're almost a little big, which creates this little bit of a lip on the side, which is also good because that's going to prevent my seeds from rolling off. So I'm already making some observations about this mat that I like. I'm using trays with drainage, uh, as everybody should. Now the paper pot tray, super heavy duty tray. I love these trays. They perform well. They're indestructible. They last forever. You know, the, these are the bootstrap trays. They're really good but I dropped this one, you know, and I dropped it from quite a height. This tray might have broken as well, but it's still, it's still got lots of life in it. Difference here, the dimensions are different. 
And so the hemp mat is going to sit in there a little differently and there's going to be space around it. I think this might be an advantage. At first I was a little skeptical, so uh, I'll be curious about that. The other thing I really, really like about the paper pot trays is very even uh, hole perforation. So water is going to come up um, pretty evenly from below if I'm doing some bottom watering. Now that's going to be a part of this experimental series, taking a look at um, how we do our watering. And I do have bottom trays here. So this is the paper pot tray. It's a little bigger, so it's not super nested like 10, 20 trays nest inside each other. I like that there's a bit of extra space there and I actually have some even bigger trays. And the reason I like the bigger trays is so when I put water in there, I can watch it being absorbed. And that's gonna be important in these trials. So I'll have to decide. I might use the paper pot tray for the 10, 20 tray, uh, the, the bottom tray for the 10, 20, and use my bigger trays for the paper pot tray so I can really watch that water absorption and how it's different between the soil and the fiber mat. I'm not going to do any trials with the aluminum trays for this one, just going to stick with these two because they're the most likely thing that you're going to use. One aspect of the trays I still have to work out, and this might throw you for a little bit of a loop, is whether I am going to put the hemp mat into the tray like this, or I'm actually going to grow it like this. What? Yeah, you're probably wondering what I'm talking about. Here's the thing, and I'm already anticipating this from my experience. When I put this hemp mat in here, it doesn't come flush with the top. And you can see with my sunflower and my wheatgrass growing here that they are. The soil comes flush to the top, the seed sits on the top, and then the, tra the, the covering tray goes on top. Why this is really good is because it actually gives a little bit of airflow in the surface. Now when I take this tray and I nest another tray on top of it in order to induce germination, there's no airflow coming across this. And so my experience in growing microgreens in soil is that that increases the risk of mold and disease during the germination process. So that's gonna be a big thing. So I may actually end up trialing this like this. Weren't ready for that one, were you? For crops, I'm gonna start with a single crop and that's wheatgrass. Starting with wheatgrass because it is so easy to grow but I have two other seed in stock in my home production system. I've got sunflower, which I'm growing here, and I've got some speckled pea as well. They're both very common crops, ones that I've really pushed onto you. And so I'm gonna try, uh, start with wheatgrass, then move on to those other ones to see how they do. This could grow wheatgrass perfectly well and just struggle with the sunflower. So it's important to do these trials with different crops. However, doing the trials with wheatgrass is gonna give me a very good sense of how the mats perform overall. You all know that an important aspect of production is your watering. So I'm anticipating doing a combination of top watering and bottom watering. Now in my current system, I don't do any bottom watering at all. I know a lot of people love this system because it keeps the crop dry. I love top watering because I like to rinse the crop off as it's growing. That makes my harvest a lot easier. I've done that both in my home and commercial production systems. Some crops you never want to top water, like radish, you know, maybe once after germination, but it doesn't dry out very well. So use your watering experience when you do trials to determine what you're going to do. I'm going to do a combination of both. Uh, one of the reasons I'm sort of preparing for the bottom tray is I'm unsure about the water retention qualities of the, the fiber mat. Uh, one in general related to crop growth and two when we've got it on the heating pad how well it's going to continue to hold that water. So that's something we're going to play around with to develop our techniques and see how those techniques may vary with the fiber mat relative to what we're doing with the soil. A lot of folks talk about microgreens in the context of them not needing any nutrients because the nutrient is already embodied in the seed. My experience tells me otherwise. Your microgreens crop does need some nutrient to be at its optimum, at its best. Now, it's true, there's nutrient in the seed, and that nutrient is there for germinating the seed, getting it out of the soil. But as soon as that crop starts to photosynthesize, it's going to want, to want nutrient. You might be able to grow some okay crops without nutrient, but you're going to grow a much better crop with nutrient. You don't need a lot. It's three or four days of growth. It's very, very small. And so that needs to be delivered in some way. Now we talked about this. In my soil, I've got compost in there. That's gonna deliver the, the nutrients perfectly, but I don't have any nutrient within this fiber mix. 
So my first trial, I'm going to use it as is. I'm not going to add any nutrient. I'm going to see what this fiber mat can do on its own. And I expect my wheatgrass is going to be in soil is going to be way better than in the fiber mat. I would love to be wrong about that, but that's my expectation based on experience. So as trials move on, I'm going to look at, well, how can I add nutrient to this mix? And I have three nutrients in mind. I could make a little compost tea. I've got some compost. A little, a little bit of compost goes a long way when you're turning it into a liquid fertilizer. Uh, I've got a, a kelp-based fertilizer I can use as well. And both of these are going to be diluted to small amounts, so I don't need a lot. And I might even consider using some of my own urine as a fertilizer as well. What? Now, I would never do this in commercial production as much as maybe I would like to. Um, but I'm thinking about the bigger picture here. Even if I'm only using a little bit of compost, that's coming from somewhere else. You know, the kelp meal is coming from somewhere else. I'm producing this urine and urine has a very, very good uh, uh, wide range of minerals and nutrients in it. So I like that. However, it's urine and there's some issues with that. But for my home production system, that's my problem. So one thing all these potential nutrient solutions have in common is there can be some odor. All of them can produce odor. And so that's going to be some management that really needs to be taken care of. Um, I will not consider any synthetic or any sort of a hydroponic mix that is not organic. Uh, that would defeat the whole purpose of doing all this. So I've got some options for nutrients if I'm not seeing the performance I, I like. It's possible I could sprinkle the tiniest little bit of really, really finely sieved compost on top of this mat as well. So there's all sorts of ways to look at this if I'm not getting the growth I want based on what I know, uh, you know, a 1020 tray or these trays can produce. Now, the last thing I've got in mind is the harvest. And there's many things that may come up, but I, I think I've covered most of the basis of, of what I want to look at in these trials. Now, the nice thing about having a soil mix here is like, this is quite heavy. The roots are well anchored in there. And so when I go to cut into that with a knife, I don't have the tray sliding around. Everything's very stable. I'm a little worried that when I go to harvest my, my crop with the fiber mat, like I'm, I'm not going to be able to have it very stable. And I've already got some ideas for that. Should be simple to solve. Um, but that's something I want to look at as well, particularly so if I end up using the tray upside down and it's sitting on top. There's not a lot anchoring that, that tray down. So lots of things to look at there, lots of possibilities. So that's the introduction to our trial. I'm super stoked about this. I've been thinking about fiber mats for a long time. I am a soil scientist by training, and so I love growing in soil. But there's a bigger impact when I'm not using soil in the ground that I can regenerate and that I can build. Um, generally, the soil is imported, and there's a lot of issues with that. Uh, we are in a serious crisis ecologically, climate-wise in the world, and this microgreens growing is great, but there's some things I think we need to address if we want to be able to continue this, and our growing medium is one of them. I'm really excited about being able to use a fiber mat that's produced in Canada uh, from hemp, which is a renewable um, resource. And so hopefully we can come up with some methods that show that, you know, we can make this transition by tweaking our uh, techniques just a little bit to have growing success to produce a high quality product. In the end, that's one of the most important things as well. If we can't produce a good product, we don't really have a great business model. And from a home production point of view, I don't want to grow stuff that isn't good quality. I'm eating this, uh, I'm juicing this, and I want it to be good. And I've had <laughs> plenty of bad wheatgrass and enough bad sunflower shoots to know that it's not even worth it. So we really need a good product in the end. So here's hoping we can get there with these fiber mats.